Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Thank you for joining us for this post-decision episode of SCOTUScast. I'm your host, Grace Gotchling. On June 18, 2020, the Supreme Court released its decision in the case Department of Homeland Security v. Regents of the University of California. By a vote of 5-4, to four, the judgment of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit was vacated in part and reversed in part. The opinion, penned by Chief Justice Roberts, was joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kagan in full and by Justice Sotomayor as to all but Part 4. Justice Sotomayor concurred in part, concurred in the judgment in part, and dissented in part. Justice Thomas concurred in the judgment in part and dissented in part, joined by Justices Alito and Gorsuch. Justices Alito and Kavanaugh also filed opinions concurring on the judgment in part and dissenting in part. And now, to discuss the case on this special panel edition episode, we have Dr. John Eastman, Henry Salvatore Professor of Law and Community Service and Director at the Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence at Chapman University Fowler School of Law, Christopher Hijack, Director of Litigation at the Immigration Reform Law Institute, Mario Laola, Senior Fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and William A. Stock, Partner at Glasgow Immigration Law Partners, LLP. I've been asked to sort of quickly set up the stage for uh, how the decision came about. If uh, you remember back to 2011, 2010, there were a lot of negotiations about providing a path forward to legal status for some or all of the approximately 11 to 12 million people uh, in the United States. And among those people, among the most sympathetic, are young people who were brought to the United States, often as children. They had no particular control over the fact that they came to the United States. And of course, um, given that there are relatively few pathways for someone who enters the United States legally, uh, sorry, illegally to become legal in the United States. Uh, many of these children have grown up, have graduated from high school, graduated from college, or uh, and there was an enormous pressure to provide some form of relief for them. In 2012, the uh, Obama administration announced the DACA program. It stood for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and it set out certain criteria in terms of a child who had been brought to the United States before the age of 16, had lived in the United States, did not have a criminal record, could come forward and could request a recognition that they were a low priority for deportation. That is called deferred action in the immigration law uh, that we've practiced. Uh, This first came to public light in the 1970s when it was applied to John Lennon uh, in a famous case. Uh, and he was granted deferred action in spite of the fact of his cannabis uh, possession uh, convictions. So it has always existed as a form of prosecutorial discretion within the immigration law that for certain people, uh, there are uh, reasons why their deportation should be deferred. This was a relatively large scale exercise of that authority. It affected uh, a potential population of approximately 1.7 million At the time, the program stopped taking new applications when President Trump cut it off in 2017. There were about 700,000 individuals who had come forward and been granted uh, that deferred action. With deferred action comes employment authorization uh, and the eligibility for certain limited public benefits. Uh, Most public benefits are, uh, of course, not eligible to anyone who has not been a permanent resident for at least five years and uh, is not a citizen of the U.S. So this case came about as a challenge to President Trump's rescission of the DACA uh, uh, program. And so uh, uh, that's kind of where we are. The history of this, I think there's sort of three things I want to highlight. And that is uh, when you read Justice Thomas's dissent, Uh, I think his argument is uh, all boils down to the perception that the deferred action program was illegally created and was an unlawful 
exercise of executive power. So I want to really take that on. Second, I want to look just briefly at the separation of powers and, and administrative law issues that uh, come out of the fact that this was issued in reliance on a legal opinion of Attorney General Sessions. And then third, uh, the federalism considerations briefly that, that we may want to think about. So the first uh, thing, that this idea that because it was created, uh, as Justice Thomas says, without statutory authority and without going through the rulemaking process, uh, I want to just raise that. So the Immigration and Nationality Act is somewhat unusual in that it both sets forth a comprehensive statutory scheme for regulating the admission, expulsion, and incorporation of foreign nationals into the population of the United States. But it also contains in with it provisions that allow the president or executive officers to ignore the statute when it's determined to be detrimental to the interests of the United States. For example, the Section 212F that's become very famous through the travel ban cases, but also for the expansion of the admission of people to the United States. We don't hear very much about Section 212D5, which allows the president to parole people into the United States for significant public benefit. So this exercise of uh, uh, deferred action uh, calls to mind two exercises of similar uh, uh, authority. So uh, Executive Order uh, 12711 was issued by George H.W. Bush in 1989 in response to the Chinese government's crackdown on pro-democracy activists in Tiananmen Square. As a matter of foreign policy, President Bush wanted to make very clear that the Chinese government uh, should be condemned for this, and he provided temporary relief that was called deferral of enforced departure to Chinese nationals who were in the United States as of June 4th, 1989. Approximately three years later, in 1992, Congress passed something called the Chinese Student Protection Act, which ultimately did give a path to legal status and permanent residence for those Chinese nationals. But for three years, the only thing which allowed them to remain in the United States was this act of administrative grace that was put in place by George Bush uh, to protect them. Similarly, if you look at the long history of Liberians in the United States, there are approximately 10,000 who were in the United States in 1991 when the first uh, war uh, began, the Civil War began in, Nigeria, in uh, Liberia, rather. And they were granted a series of temporary statuses until finally just this last year, uh, Congress decided to grant uh, probably about 3,000 who had not figured out a way to get a green card already uh, became green card holders through uh, the opportunity arose to become green card holders through an act of Congress. So we have you know, a more than 20 year period of time where people were granted these temporary relief from deportation and work permission because of foreign policy concerns. So these examples illustrate how immigration enforcement power is tied to the president's power to conduct foreign relations and to consider the effects that the full enforcement of U.S. immigration law might have on U.S. relationships with foreign powers. So in the China example, President Bush granted refuge to Chinese nationals as a way of repudiating the CCP's crackdown on its own people. And in the Liberia example, uh, they were modified by the United States special relationship with Liberia, uh, given the role that we had in its founding, and of course, the economic impacts of allowing Liberians in the United States to send money back to their home country. So the bottom line, only three justices agreed with Thomas that the end of DACA could be predicated upon it being illegal. So it's not surprising that the basic structure of the program of DACA was similar to powers exercised for many, many years by many, many presidents of both parties going back to the 1950s. So that brings us to the separation of powers issue and the sort of administrative law concerns that flow from that. So it's axiomatic that it's the province of the judiciary to say what the law is. And that's whether they're interpreting specific statutory language or the extent of executive authority or the lawfulness of an administrative action. So this case began when the attorney general issued a letter to the Department of Homeland Security saying that he believed that the program was unlawful, ignoring, for example, the Supreme Court's decision in Arizona versus United States, which recognized that the immigration agencies had broad discretion to initiate removal proceedings or to, to decline to do so, and to consider human, human concerns, individual equities, or policy choices that bear on this nation's foreign relations. So the court is presented in this case with a dilemma. The attorney general issues a legal 
uh, determination of DACA's in, uh, invalidity. And DHS relies only on the fact of that illegality. In fact, two months after the litigation started, one of the courts offered the DHS the opportunity to reframe its reasons for revoking a DACA as a policy matter, and they declined to do so. It wasn't only until after there were three injunctions in place that Secretary Nielsen winds up issuing the second uh, justification for the rescission of DACA, which includes both the legal grounds and the policy grounds. So here I have great sympathy for the way Justice Kavanaugh resolves the tension. He comes out and he doesn't entirely endorse the AG's assertion that the program is illegal, but he would credit Secretary Nielsen's later assertion of the policy reasons why this administration chooses to uh, revoke the DACA program. So the justices would agree DHS, having made a policy in a prior administration, can make a different forbearance policy for a new administration. But where I think Justice Roberts comes down on this and, uh, is that there's part of a bigger pattern of kind of violence to administrative law principles, right? Time and time again, we've seen this administration trying to make large policy changes, especially in the area of immigration, with really slapdash justifications and circumventing good administrative practices. There's no better example than the travel ban, where if we remember the Supreme Court's decision in Trump versus Hawaii was about the third version of the travel ban. People forget that in 2017, the original version of the travel ban was so messily rolled out that four days after it was issued, the Office of Legal Counsel had to issue an interpretation of its own proclamation because the language was so unclear that it wasn't uh, the the administration thought that it should apply to people who already had green cards. So it also included, uh, it was full of unintended consequences, like including a bar on Iraqi nationals who received their immigrant visas because they were providing material assistance to the U.S. military. No one had thought of that. So that wasn't until the second travel ban that those folks were, were excluded. So Faced with the unintended consequences and modified rationales for the proclamation, the Supreme Court, I think, took the opportunity to uh, sort of criticize the administration's uh, ready, fire, aim approach to immigration policymaking. So the final thing I would just mention is I think there are federalism concerns. Immigration is a federal law. It displaces most state uh, efforts to regulate immigration or immigrants, the Supreme Court uh, emphasized in Arizona versus the United States. States have different interests in the DACA context. Texas and 27 other states challenged the expansion of DACA and the DAPA program in federal court. But New York, California, and 20 other states challenged the travel ban. They challenged the rescission of DACA. <laughs> so Texas uh, stressed the expenses that uh, new immigrants bring uh, to the United States. But California, Washington, New York, these other uh, uh, states have emphasized the benefits that these uh, foreign nationals bring. Uh, after all, the states have now spent lots and lots of money to educate these young folks. They are just now reaching the age where they are taxpaying citizens because they have work authorization. All of their taxation, all of their earnings are on the books. These states are looking at substantial uh, loss in revenue if the work authorization granted to these students is taken away. So. I, you know, again, the president has said that the administration will end the DACA program, that he wants to take care of the DACA folks. I think the Congress is the right place for a permanent solution. But I think the court was holding the administration's feet to the fire to say that if they were going to end this program, they had to do it as a matter of policy. And they had to own that since approximately 70 to 73 percent of people in most polls uh, support giving a path to legal status to these young folks. Uh, the president has to own as a policy matter that his administration prefers to take away the, the protection that they have until Congress gets around to acting on it. So, uh, Chris Hayek, I know you have a slightly different take on all this. And why don't you go ahead? OK, thank you, Bill. Um... I would like to react first before I start to something you just said that uh, where and it was originally said by Chief Justice Marshall that it is the province of the judiciary to say what the law is. Uh, it would be nice if it were that simple, but it's not. Uh, all all of the executive branch branch officials take an oath to uphold the Constitution. So to to the extent that Secretary Duke or Nielsen thought that uh, DACA was unconstitutional. 
uh, they would be violating their oath in their view if they continued to enforce it. And this, there's precedent for this view. Thomas Jefferson thought that uh, the, the Alien and Sedition Acts were unconstitutional, and he refused to enforce them. Uh, Obama thought that uh, DOMA was unconstitutional and refused to enforce it. But, you know, with that said, I, I'm not sure that disposes of the case either. Um, what I want to talk about is this opinion and what it means. There's very, aside from its result, which continues DACA, there's very little or nothing in this opinion to give any comfort to uh, 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 proponents of, and supporters of DACA. In fact, I think it's written in big letters in this opinion that DACA is doomed, and it's just um, a matter of time and, and, and method. It would be very easy, comparatively speaking, for the Trump administration to do it, quote, right this time and follow the chief justice's view of what's required for reasoned decision making and explain itself more fully. Uh, it doesn't have to base it only on policy. It, it can... Um, uh, deal with, say, reliance interests in a number of ways, the chief suggests. All of them would probably be okay, but, you know, he, they didn't do any of it, so that's why, you know, it wasn't good enough. And uh, it could deal with the forbearance part by saying that DACA should have gone through notice and comment, but it didn't. So the whole thing is unlawful, including the forbearance part, you know, the uh, deferred action part. And, you know, that can be done. And apparently Trump said this morning that that's what he's going to do. So that would be the end of DACA, because I think that would be upheld. Now, I would caution the administration to put it through notice and comment, because now in this case, it was hard for the plaintiffs to argue that uh, the rescission had to get notice and comment, because th that would imply that DACA needed notice and comment, which it did. and. Uh, they didn't want to make that argument, but nevertheless, to be safe, I would put it through notice and comment. But if Trump doesn't rescind it, then uh, Judge Hainan in Texas is uh, going to enjoin it. Uh, that that case is getting started again after this decision, and uh, it, where Doc is being challenged by Texas and other states, and uh, he's bound by his opinion in the DAPA case, which directly transfers to this because DAPA included expanded DACA. And then the Fifth Circuit would uphold that. And then it would go to the Supreme Court. The court might not grant cert uh, and just leave it at the Fifth Circuit. But it also, uh, if it did grant cert, I think it would affirm the Fifth Circuit. Because one of the votes uh, affirming the DAPA decision of the Fifth Circuit was Chief Justice Roberts. And uh, the, the other four conservatives seem to be there. So it does seem that DACA is doomed. I would say, though, that has a charmed life, and so I hesitate to make any absolute prediction. And I would also add that if you're an opponent, as uh, my organization is, of big amnesties that'll just encourage much more illegal immigration and compound the problem uh, created by decades of, of lax enforcement, uh, DACA is convenient. It's, uh, it prevents, by its, by its existence, it makes much less likely uh, a congressional deal you know, between Congress and the president to give a much larger amnesty to all so-called dreamers who number, you know, by the various uh, definitions that are uh, used in such deals, you know, they're, they are far more numerous than just the 700,000 DACA recipients. But as long as DACA is there, there's no big impetus for Congress or the president to act and reach such a such a deal. So it seems like DACA is going to go, and um, and it seems like Trump's going to rescind it. But if he does not, it's going to go down in, in the uh, courts, uh, I would say. Okay, I think uh, Mr. Eastman has a even, uh, Professor Eastman has an even more uh, critical view of this decision, and I'll pass it on to him. Okay, this is John Eastman, and uh, I should make one correction in my introduction. My uh, my role, the hat I wear is the 
director of the Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence is under the auspices of the Claremont Institute, who have been gracious to allow me to do that litigation work before the Supreme Court in uh, more than 20 years now, uh, including in this case. Um, so that off, off the table. Uh, uh, I, I think Chief Justice Roberts is a majority opinion here is uh, nothing shy of pure sophistry. And I, uh, they, those are strong words, but I think they are warranted here. Uh, and let me first take issue with the legality of DACA. Uh, there are several components here that need to be considered. The first is the the uh, deferred action itself. We're not going to prosecute uh, or or put into civil deportation proceedings people who meet certain criteria. Now, um, the memo that Janet Napolitano wrote uh, creating the DACA program goes out of its way to try and claim that that is being done in the exercise of prosecutorial discretion on a case by case basis because the legal precedent requires the exercise of prosecutorial discretion to be on a case-by-case basis. A wholesale categorical suspension of the law for a large category of citizens is a legislative act, not an executive act of prosecutorial discretion. And while the Supreme Court has never struck down such an act, it has strongly hinted that there is a line there that cannot be crossed from prosecutorial discretion to wholesale suspension of the law. The prior being valid exercise of executive power, the latter being invalid or unconstitutional. I think DACA's deferred action component pushes the limit or crosses that line itself. But even um, if the court was unwilling to take that step, um, how much prosecutorial discretion, how big a class, how uh, great the exercise of prosecutorial discretion for how many people, that might well be a non-justiciable political issue that the court wouldn't ultimately resolve. And I think that's why that has been on hold for so long. But, but, but even if you assume they're not going to hold that aspect of it unconstitutional, um, there are two other pieces of this. You cannot, through the exercise of prosecutorial discretion not to take action, confer some lawful status on somebody. Uh, that's not an exercise of prosecutorial discretion. That's changing the law. And yet DACA purports to create a lawful presence. It goes out of its way to say we're creating a lawful presence, not a lawful status. That's just pure hypocrisy. Right? And, and, th- and then beyond that, having created this illegal lawful presence, they then afford benefits to people who are now deemed by the administration to be lawfully present that are directly contrary to the exercise of authority conveyed by Congress. And in fact, as we noted in our brief, a direct violation, the prohibition in Article 1, Section 9 of drawing funds from the Treasury without the authority of Congress. We have Social Security benefits. We have work authorizations. We have Medicare benefits. We have retroactive uh, uh, refunds on earned income tax credit uh, that were all done because of Janet Napolitano's unilateral decision to confer lawful presence on this entire class of citizens and then provide benefits that were not, not only not authorized by Congress, but directly contrary to the prohibitions in the actual statutes. So I think there's a, easily an, an argument to be made that DACA itself was unconstitutional. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly uh, beyond the statutory authority. Um, uh, that now, the second piece of this, and why I think Chief Justice Roberts' opinion is pure sophistry. Um, he says we have to look at the two components, the conferral of benefits and the decision not to prosecute separately. Because if we look at it just as a decision not to prosecute, that may well be non-reviewable under the Administrative Procedure Act, as, as decisions of prosecutorial discretion are. But Chief Justice Robertson tells us, but this did more than that. It conveyed a status, lawful presence, and it conferred benefits. And those two judgments needed to go through the Administrative Procedures Act because Trump's decision did not or did not comport with the requirements fully of the Administrative Procedures Act, according to Roberts, then the rescission of that is uh, is a violation of the Administrative Procedures Act. He makes no mention whatsoever that Napolitano's memo that created that program in the first place likewise did not go through the Administrative Procedures Act. And if it's illegal on those grounds to rescind it, it must have been illegal to put it in place in the first place. And this is the key point that Justice Thomas makes in dissent. The notion 
that they have to perpetuate an illegal program without, you know, before, unless they themselves go through hoops of the Administrative Procedures Act, that the program's implementation itself did not go through is laughable. Uh, and then we get back around to uh, the final decision of Chief Justice Roberts, that that DHS secretary only looked at the benefits piece of this. This was the part that was illegal. It didn't address the rescission of the deferred action itself. Um, but once we've disaggregated those two things, how does the de the uh, deferred action itself even require Administrative Procedure Act uh, processes when it's an exercise of prosecutorial discretion? At bottom, what this case is, is, is a continuing effort to thwart the, 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 this administration from implementing one of the key policy agendas that was the centerpiece of his campaign in 2016. And here we are now four years in to this administration and still not able to implement that policy. And one last piece on this, and I will r raise this as a question. It's curious to me that this case was argued all the way back in November, seven months ago. There's nothing in any of these opinions that warranted seven months to get out the door. And I sure want to raise the question why it took so long to put it all the way till June when it may be too late for the administration now to go through the hoops that Roberts is, I think, erroneously set up for it in order to get it done b before the end of, of the present administration. That, to me, is a travesty. It undermines the effect of the last election. Election, uh, and I think it is an imposition of the judiciary on this administration in a way that it would not impose on any other administration in history. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and I've got a lot more to say about it, as you might imagine, but I'll pass it on now to our next guest. Uh, thank you, John. This is Mario. Uh, this is Mario Loyola, everyone. Thank you, Dean, for having us all on this, on this call for him. Um, I, I'm just going to talk uh, very briefly uh, uh, to raise a couple of sort of bottom line problems that I see arising from this decision, and which arise really from its reasoning and the very circular argument that uh, Roberts appears to be making here. Um, and, it, and it's weirdly circular for him because agree or disagree with Justice Roberts, his opinions are usually pretty clear. And even if he does sometimes uh, creatively misdescribe precedents in order to uh, fill in the reasoning for his own opinion, um, this is an opinion in which there were several points, maybe it's just me, but there were several points where I was just left scratching my head wondering what on earth the Chief Justice was talking about. And, and it's, it's really to just contemplate the circularity of this argument. Though, Justice Roberts, the court here has ruled that those parts of DACA that were not illegal for failing to observe APA procedures cannot be rescinded unless the rescission follows APA procedures. I mean, that, that just cannot possibly be correct. And so what they're setting up is a different standard for a completely different standard for what a rescission would have to would have to have under State Farm than the original regulatory action, uh, which apparently is not held in this case to any procedure at all. Um, so in holding that the rescission is reviewable. Uh, Roberts recognized that the deferred prosecution is not merely a refusal to institute proceedings. I think Professor Eastman remarked on this as well. So Roberts admits that it's, that it's not merely a case of uh, prosecutorial discretion, because even the, even the forbearance part of this, the deferred action, creates a series of processes and reliance interests that are adjudicative and constitute benefits. So that would seem to expand the holding in Texas versus United States, which said the parts of DAPA, you know, DAPA is likely going to be uh, vacated because there are the parts of DAPA, there are parts of DAPA that create benefits that are not merely an exercise of unreviewable agency action. Roberts here, in order to justify his own review, reviewability of the rescission, is saying that all of DACA and DAPA basically create substantive benefits. So he goes on to say that they don't, you know, the court doesn't like post hoc rationalizations, but we're requiring it here. But the explanation has to be careful not to explain too much. Uh, and God forbid that the explanation should include reasons in addition to those originally found to be insufficient. 
Uh, and so people say, you know, the one takeaway that, that, that I'm hearing a, a lot is that this decision portends that DACA is doomed and it, because it lays out a roadmap for its rescission. I'm not so confident that that's the case because the roadmap that Roberts has laid out here is very confusing and it's not really at all clear where it leads. So the, the, the court says that the government can either rest in, in saying what Nielsen should have done. The court says the government can either rest on the original reasons for the rescission or it can issue a new rescission on the basis of new reasons. But if it rests on the original rescission, it can only elaborate on the reasons for the original decision if those reasons are found wanting. But it can't use additional new reasons. And it almost seemed as if Roberts was rejecting the rescission on the ground, the Nielsen memo on the ground, that it had additional justifications in addition to the ones mentioned in an explanation that was found insufficient. I mean, it's just so circular. I can't, it's hard to wrap your head around it. Um, so, you know, uh, the circularity here of, of this, of the court's reasoning, means that the rule, the takeaway that lawyers will draw from this case is very indeterminate. I mean, it's very hard to it's very hard to predict what a court would do in a future case using this decision and this opinion as precedent. So, especially because Robert is saying here that when you withdraw uh, an agency action because of its illegality, you have to consider the various components of the program separately. Uh, but this is, this is not a rule. It's just a permission for future courts to talk about any rescission no policy that they don't like, because you will always be able to think of a policy element that the agency didn't consider separately They're at some level. Uh, so there, there's a couple, I'll just end by highlighting a couple of, of even sort of top-line takeaways, bigger takeaways. First, there's a difference between prosecutorial discretion in a current case with respect to an action that has already occurred, and prosecutorial discretion as applied to future cases uh, prospectively before they've even occurred. And there's a further difference between an agency or an administration concluding that an entire program is illegal and that it therefore is not going to enforce it. That's problematic enough. But what, what the Obama administration did in this situation was to say, we're going to pick and choose who we're, we're going to refuse to apply this category of law to an entire category of people, but we're going to apply it in other cases. And so this elevation of prosecutorial discretion is, is almost uh, a kind of royal prerogative of suspension. It's a legislative power. It's, it, it's, if the practice is followed, it's going to allow uh, future administrations to basically rewrite the law. So uh, the, the even bigger problem than that is the problem raised by separation of is, is the separation of powers problem here that you see. This is another example of agents of, of courts always, always, always getting deference wrong. Uh, they the Chevron is based on the idea that courts should defer to agency interpretations of law, which is the courts. Uh, area of competency. All of these other doc deference doctrines counsel that the court should not defer to agencies in the agency's core competency, which is determinations of fact and implementation, development and implementation of policy. And so this is a, a bad decision for uh, separation of powers, and it's, and it's a bad decision for uh, in terms of legal reasoning, and I am not surprised that Professor Eastman was an exercise this I think I've ever heard. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia.
This has been a FedSoc audio production. <laughs>